Here is how I made the Xylo table, a musical coffee table. So the prompt for this project, uh, as this was a school assignment at K-State, uh, was to build a uh, furniture piece that could be collapsed, um, and we had to pick a style that it would be designed in or abstracted from, and so I picked de style. Um, which is uh, from the Netherlands from the early 20th century and if you don't know anything about it uh, essentially it was intended to be a sort of universal visual language um, represent more than uh, the composition itself and it used a lot of geometric forms of lines and rectangles and as you'll notice primary colors with a structure of um, black lines and some white space and all that sort of thing the Rietfeld chair is that little chair sitting up top, and it's sort of an iconic piece from this movement. And so in designing uh, a furniture piece from this style, I thought, well, what's another universal uh, language? Music. And so maybe a, something, a way it can represent more than itself would be that it's a musical coffee table. Uh, instead of just being a coffee table, it's actually a musical. Uh, and then what kind of musical coffee table, um, uh, what type of instrument would that be? Well, uh, a xylophone would be something to model that after, uh, since it has a lot of lines and rectangles and whatnot. So the goal was to create an easy-to-assemble coffee table infused with musical quality for amusement and inspiration. Started off with some research looking into what makes uh, a xylophone or any of its relatives, the marimba, etc., uh, work. Um, how do you get different pitches? Because as a musician and composer, I would prefer that it actually have precise pitches rather than vaguely um, noticeable different uh, notes. So looked at it and apparently to get a lower pitch uh, in your uh, wood pieces they need to be either longer, thinner, or denser than the ones that are uh, similar to them. And then if you want it to go to be a higher pitch then you make them shorter or thicker uh, or uh, more dense. Looked at different types of wood that are good to make this sort of thing and uh, rosewood is ideal but I wasn't going to do that for multiple reasons so I went with maple uh, seemed like a, a good hearty hardwood that also would stain well and uh, had good musical quality at least good enough so I explored some different ways of maybe I play with uh, stacking it so that it, the thickness can change but the length doesn't and different variations uh, then my professor uh, pushed me to maybe explore some more interesting and exciting uh, designs, and that's what you can see there. So this was iteration one, and uh, this was with that sort of idea of maybe they get thicker, that's how I change the pitch so I can stay a rectangle, but this was really boring, and as I said, uh, my fr professor said, well, make something a little more interesting. So I did this, but then it started to not look very... Uh, much like the original style that I was modeling after. And so um, I started to go with this uh, third iteration uh, after the, or for the mid crit, saying this is where I was going with it. And in getting ready for the mid crit or mid critique, made uh, this tiny baby little study model, and it. Um, yeah, it's it was interesting. It wasn't very well balanced, but it, it was interesting. And so uh went and tried to make a full-scale one, and I wanted to see if I could actually tune pieces of wood and see how that goes. So I made a quick little structure for them to sit on so I could get on to trying that out. And so here it is, uh, the model I would use for the critique to as a sort of uh, proof of concept. And I uh, was able to get 18 notes, and uh, it sounded really good. Um, and showed that to the mid crit, and then some of the 
feedback was on where I was going to go after that sort of proof of, proof of concept to try to get uh, more of that dish style uh, look with the structure of the legs, as you can see. Uh, some of the comments were maybe that uh, this jagged edge um, that was being uh, shown because of uh, the nature of pieces of woods changing in density and length, trying to get different pitches, uh, was probably not user-friendly if someone were to hit that accidentally or it just didn't look super clean. So went with something like this. And that was what I would then go on to design for the final. A lot cleaner. So I went back into trying to figure out how I could tune pieces of wood by not having them get too long because I this is a coffee table so it's not supposed to be huge uh, only about uh, 20 inches in depth so uh, learned about how to carve the underside by making a little arch and keeping the nodes uh, which are these little spots over here uh, where the uh, wavelengths kind of cancel each other out if I understand the science correctly and uh, so that's where you'll put uh, the where they connect to the structure via either a string or a dowel with felt, which is what I went with, etc. And so started playing with a bunch of pieces, figuring out how I could create a structure for this new system set in with having a frame go around it, and figuring out how that would be all constructed. And toyed some more with how how much uh, carving out would actually change the pitch. Then went and got some wood from Menards initially to uh, start making the structure and build this thing from the ground up. Cut up some pieces and glued them together. There's some glue. And there's them gluing with a bunch of clamps. With a bunch of clamps. That's a lot of clamps. And they're doing a sort of little synchronized uh, something there, I guess. Yeah. And so there they are, all gluing in the glue room. Then, uh, some other day later, I went to Roberson Lumberyard. It's, uh, I drove from Manhattan, Kansas, all the way to Topeka, Kansas. I say all the way, it was only like an hour drive, but um, over there they've got this nice big uh, warehouse of all sorts of types of wood. So if you're in the area and you're looking for quality and variety of uh, different hardwoods and such, uh, they've, they've, they've got you covered. It's, and they're, they're really helpful and uh, it's a great place, so check them out. And there is a, a couple of pieces here, I think... It was like an 11 foot and an 8 foot, uh, and I cut one of them in half, and uh, yeah, some good old maple hardwood, and took it back to school, put it in the little uh, place where you can store wood and keep it safe and cool and all that, then later took those pieces that were gluing and used the chop saw to straighten them up a little bit on the ends. Then uh, started to uh, cut some felt that night, probably. I don't remember when each of these pictures were taken exactly. This was over the course of, oh, probably six weeks in total for the whole project. But at one point started uh, cutting some felt circles to um, put uh, underneath the felt and each of the colors would match with that rendering you saw earlier under each note uh, so you know where to put uh, the right piece of wood. Then used the table saw to rip the pieces of uh, wood that we got from Roberson, as you can see there. Then took those pieces of wood that uh, were gluing earlier uh, that I got from Menards and started using this machine here to carve out uh, slots for them to then um, make the H's, the legs, uh, used a router table with a round over bit to round the edges of those, uh, of the legs part of the H's structure thing. And there they are fitting together. Looks very nice. Little eighth inch fillet. And there they are standing up. They don't have glue yet, but they could still stand up because that nice little um, slot for them to sit in. 
And there they are, getting ready for their glue. There they are, yep. And now they've got some glue, and so now they're doing the gluing. Then took the stretchers and used a uh, handsaw and a chisel and started carving out some little notches uh, so that they could actually sit on those H's and keep the structure upright. And there they are, uh, there they are uh, testing with the H's that are now glued uh, and making sure that they're wide enough and deep enough for it to actually uh, sit in. And so there it is. Um, uh, as you can see, kind of testing it out to see if it lines up, if the angle, which was about 5.8 degrees, uh, was the, the taper of it. Um, and then use some more chiseling and sawing to cut out uh, then half of the overlap in the H's. Half of it was done in the stretcher, as you can see there, and half in this, so that they would meet halfway in each other, which is like five five eighths of an inch, I believe. Use this CNC machine to cut out some uh, some joints for the uh, top structure that the bars would sit on. And there it is. There, things are starting to line up and sit together, and it's starting to look like a like a table, like a project. And doing some more felt cutting, a lot more circles, getting those all made up, and cutting little holes in them. Made, oh, over a hundred of these at least, probably. Some good old E6000 glue. Then used a uh, drill press to drill holes through the structures so that I could uh, slot in some brass dowels to hold this thing all together. I wanted to minimize the use of screws or nails or staples or anything um, you know, not very sightly uh, like that and try to keep this as clean and easy to take apart and put together as possible. So that's why we have simply this sort of tight fit overlaps and dowel going through the four corners and that's about all the connection you got. And it uh, holds together very, very well. There it is, starting to line up, see how well they slide in. Uh, that was kind of the scary part of gluing them and making sure they'd still uh, sit in that quarter inch hole there. Then glued up some uh, pieces of wood to make the secondary non-musical um, void filling portion of the table since uh, the bar is tapered. And so then to keep a rectangle, this would fill in that missing space. Uh, gluing the structure together. This was uh, sort of a frantic moment, trying to keep things square and all of that. Then cut a bunch of mini dowels uh, that the bars would use uh, with the felts to stay in place. Use this uh, router to cut a dovetail slots for that uh, secondary surface to uh, sit in for gluing. And had to do it in the surface it's, it's as well, of course, doing the negative. And there it is, slotted in and sitting on it. And there you can see a close-up of that. Then I cut the dowels to just the right length, went to Menard to try to find some way of... Actually, this is Hobby Lobby, now that I remember, seeing all that string back there. Um, uh, to find some way to give it a nice cap on the top, and I couldn't really find anything. And then my dad suggested some uh, little furniture caps. Uh, I got that from then Home Depot. Here is a, um, using a tap and die set, I created some threads on the brass so I could use that furniture cap. As you can see, that's right there. It was brass as well, so they would match. And so making sure that fits in and sits flush on that. And so I would use a little metal grip there and sit it in there and then use the, the die on that. And there they are. And uh, it was very much um, a very tedious process uh, using that, twisting it around them by hand and pouring oil on them. And if you ever get off by slightly, you're not going perfectly straight down, then these uh, won't actually then go down on them straight, of course. And so then that is problematic because then it won't sit flush on the top of the wood. So I had to uh, 
do a couple of them over, and then even then, they still weren't perfect, but they finally worked. And use this uh, metal sander to grind the ends of these so they weren't sharp and dangerous. Here is that secondary surface here, and then you can see there's the void for the bars. And gluing that all together, making sure it's square. Gluing in those pegs, those dowels, into the, uh, the bars support. And there it is, getting a feel for what that's going to look like. And use the drill press again to drill holes uh, into the other piece of wood that the other end of the uh, dowels would go into. And then started some sanding. I'm starting to get really exciting here and um, really getting, getting close to moving on to the final uh, major aspect of it, which would be actually making the bars and tuning them. So there's all the different pieces, as you can see. Lay them down on the, and this was a, um, this is a sanding table that actually is like a giant vacuum cleaner, and it sucks all the dust when you sand it into it. So it's kind of kind of nice. And uh, so then I went to Menards again and customized some stain. This is just a short little video here. And uh, and so customize it. Took some of the maple there to test on and. Um, Got the different colors I needed, the bluish, the indigoish blue, the yellow, the red, and uh, the onyx. So we don't want to watch that again. And uh, there we go. And so there's the onyx that I got. Put that on the freshly sanded uh, structural pieces. This is in the finish room. Then moving on to the very uh, important part, of course, this is kind of the whole point of the project, is the tuning of the bars and the pieces. As you can see in the lower mid-left here, um, this is the uh, construction drawing set that I had to create, um, but also had to create just so I could use them myself. And um, as you can see, there's this sort of somewhat regular stepping of the pieces, Problem is, that can be tough um, to get uh, chromatic notes uh, out of each of these and still maintain that sort of regular stepping because, well, wood is real. And it's uh, the density can change even in the same piece of wood right next to each other when you chop it in half. So um, trying to get that result was definitely very tricky. And what I had to do... Uh, it was very much a puzzle, and it was driving me crazy here and there, but uh, found a piece of wood that hit the right pitch uh, at a certain length, and then I would take some more pieces and see if I could get them to be a, at the right length, and also, um, you know, like share a similar density, and if I could get a set of those. And if that worked, great. Then I'd move on and, and find another one that would hit the right pitch, and if they would, and they were at the right length, then I could then take these and pitch all of them back down uh, so that they would hit the right uh, sequence and, uh, and lead into this note, uh, these top two notes that would be uh, where they wanted to be sort of dictating what the rest of these would end up getting pitched back down to. So that probably didn't make any sense, uh, but that's pretty much what I ended up doing. And uh, yeah, so here you can see Carving that underside and sanding it to try to uh, tune the notes. Here is the structure, <laughs> just waiting for the for the bars to get done. Uh, all the felts in place, the dowels uh, mostly done, and the structure um, all stained and ready to go. Just another angle of it. The brass looking very nice. And so tuning some more. Almost got all 18 of the keys done. And I realized as I was doing that, that uh, the I could actually chop that 5.8 degree taper off of the ends of these uh, boards on one end so that they would uh, line up with uh, that secondary surface a little nicer instead of being stepped looking. They're still gonna have a little bit of a stepping look, but it would be a little more, um, a little a cleaner look with them having that sort of uh, cut. And that didn't seem to 
uh, affect the pitch too much. So that was good. Then uh, this is some more uh, just progress pictures of tuning them, showing how I would do that. At first, I would mark on them with a pencil uh, and start to kind of get the hang of how much would would uh, tune it to if I needed to go down a whole third or a whole perfect fourth or something, then I could use this bandsaw and chop that out and then round uh, and sand that off and carve out just a little bit more with this uh, sanding uh, table. This uh, little uh, doohickey here uh, is like a giant uh, rounded uh, sanding uh, pole that would uh, spin and you would push this up against it and sand your piece. And so here are all the pieces, and I would take uh, a uh, this little uh, tool here and uh, widen the holes. I guess it's called rabbiting, is if I remember correctly, and uh, make sure that they would actually fit on these uh, on the dowels. And getting ready to glue those, and then getting into some finishing. And start with the yellow first, and the uh, sort of logic behind the coloring was that yellow would be on the notes that don't have sharps. So uh, if you're familiar with a piano uh, or just any instrument, you know that uh, E and B uh, do not have sharps. There is no such thing as an E sharp, and there's no such thing as a B sharp. So this way, because the notes are not arranged in a typical xylophone marimba piano format with the um, uh, like a C sharp and a D sharp uh, offset above the natural notes, um, this would help uh, orient whoever's utilizing this. That oh, so this you know you've got these C C sharp D D sharp and E, and then you know it starts again F. F sharp, G, G sharp, A, A sharp, B. And so it just helps orient a little quicker uh, so you know where you are. And realized I need to cut a lot more of these because uh, those bars were not exactly flush with that outside frame, which, is, which I wanted them to be, so I had to cut some more of these later that night. And so here I am doing the final rabbiting of these pieces that were stained. And then uh, shaving off and filing the uh, uh, dowels. And I wanted to keep them also as flush as I could, using some duct tape to protect the other pieces that I didn't want to file. And back into the staining room and staining the rest of the pieces. The blue would be uh, the sharps notes. Uh, kind of like on a piano key, you've got the white notes and black notes, and so these would be uh, the black notes, and then red would be the white notes, and then stained them all, and then glued the, the final felt pieces on. Then I realized that the red and, and blue were just a little, uh, a little too saturated and deep. Uh, for what I wanted, so I, I used, I, I sanded them and made them just a little bit lighter, and you could see the wood grain a little easier, uh, and did the same to yellow so that it felt like it uh, belonged with them, and I liked the result of that, and gave it a just slightly more rustic look in a way, sort of a worn uh, look, and yeah, then here is the final model. Ta-da! And uh, the tuning, uh, the staining didn't adjust the tuning at all, so that was nice. Used some semi-gloss uh, uh, polyacrylic on the whole project, so it has a nice little bit of a sheen on it. And there you have it, the Xylo table. And this was the uh, promotional poster that I had to print out and have laminated uh, to show off uh, the project as well as some sister projects that I designed fairly quickly and I didn't build those. The, the idea was to have a family of 
three projects and build one of them. And so I built this one, of course, and then had a rendering uh, showing how these would relate to that. And so you got this nice little living room scene uh, where there's a hint at children and hit hint at musicians, uh, since that's kind of showing the different types of users. Uh, for this, it's a good children height, as you can see here. It's 19 inches, and so uh, like my nephews, you know, who are uh, very young, I uh, can just walk up to it and tap on it or use the mallet, and uh, they really like that. And, uh, and then just a couple highlights about it. In fact, as I mentioned, that no screws are required, and, um, and the color-coded playable top. That's really interesting for a coffee table. Um, and uh, so yeah. That's the Xylo Table Musical Coffee Table.